You probably know about the life of Queen Elizabeth of England, and maybe you're watching Rain, a television show about the life of Mary, Queen of Scots. They were two famous rivals whose lives intertwined in surprising, fascinating ways. But how did that rivalry end? Find out today on Footnoting History. Welcome to another episode of Footnoting History. I am this week's host, Leslie Skousen, and today we are going to explore the death of Mary, Queen of Scots in 1587. But first, some context. Elizabeth of England and Mary, Queen of Scots, had lives that were intertwined. They were second cousins once removed. Elizabeth was the daughter to Henry VIII and granddaughter to Henry VII. Mary was the granddaughter of Margaret, the elder sister of Henry VIII. Both women became queens, but their lives were substantially different. Elizabeth was born in 1533, but relegated quickly to the status of bastard with the execution and divorce between her father and Anne Boleyn. Most of Elizabeth's childhood was spent in the shadow of her heir apparent brother, Edward VI, and her older sister, Mary Tudor, who became queen in 1553. Mary Tudor is not to be confused with Mary Stuart, who was the Queen of Scotland. Mary Tudor was Elizabeth's older sister. Mary Stuart was her cousin. Under Mary Tudor's reign, a rebellion sought to replace Mary I with Elizabeth. In response to this failed revolt, Elizabeth was imprisoned by her sister. Elizabeth's path to ascend the throne at age 25 was an unlikely and unexpected journey. By contrast, Mary Stuart was born in Woodlock and became Queen of Scotland at the tender age of six days. Her father had died from wounds incurred at the Battle of Solway Moss in 1542. Her mother acted as regent and arranged a highly prized marriage contract with France. The young queen grew up in the French court, betrothed to the Dauphin. While her young life at the French court might not have been full of as many murder mysteries and intrigue as portrayed by the dramatized television show Rain, it was indeed a sophisticated childhood, surrounded by her French relatives, powerful Catholic cardinals, and her family by marriage. Mary was only Queen of France for a year. Her husband died as a teenager, and Mary's life changed abruptly as she returned to Scotland to assume her position as Queen. And so we have two striking journeys to the throne in the British Isles, one fraught with changing status from heiress to bastard to traitor to queen, and the other from queen at six days old to the glory of claiming multiple crowns, even controversially claiming the crown of England at one point, before being widowed as a teenager and returned to her unfamiliar homeland of Scotland. The sister queens would never meet face to face, Rumors of secret meetings existed, even one suggesting that one queen dress up as a boy page and meet the other in secret, but such meetings probably never happened, as much as we would like to imagine it. Their adult lives were heavily related to each other in spite of never meeting. Elizabeth influenced Mary's choice and second husband, the Englishman Lord Darnley. There was a tenuous diplomacy in their formal interactions. As cousins and queens of the same isle, they had to cooperate but underneath their cooperation and formality was a burning tension. For Catholics who did not recognize the validity of the Church of England or Henry's decisions as the supreme head of that church, Elizabeth was an illegitimate child. She could not inherit the throne. This left Mary as the authentic Queen of England. In an age of rebellions and religious wars, this was not ridiculous to imagine a Catholic force assassinating or otherwise removing Elizabeth from the English throne and replacing her with the Catholic Mary, who already had a claim. Mary's time in Scotland was dramatic and tense. The many complex issues would take scores of episodes to tease out properly, and so I apologize for the brevity. But within seven years, Mary Stuart had alienated the Lords of Scotland. She offended both Protestant and Catholic subjects and abdicated her throne under duress from a Scottish prison. In May of 1568, she escaped that prison, fled to Scotland, and sought protective custody in England, where perhaps she could gather a foreign army to help her regain her throne. She would never see Scotland again. Elizabeth was immediately placed in a difficult position with the arrival of her royal cousin. As the presumptive heir, unless Elizabeth married and had children, Mary's presence posed a threat to Elizabeth. 
and assumed Air provided unhappy courtiers with a second person from whom they could seek favors and fortune. This diluted Elizabeth's power, yet releasing Mary to seek a different foreign power to help regain her Scottish throne would only embolden Mary and her royal claims. There was a trial to see if she were legally complicit in the murder of her second husband, Lord Darnley, but it came to nothing. Ultimately, Elizabeth imprisoned Mary for 19 years. During that time, Mary was very active. Her jailers allowed ladies-in-waiting to give her every luxury and provide company to the imprisoned queen. She heard mass from a special priest assigned to her. She wrote letters to family in France and to sympathetic supporters in Scotland. She also allegedly wrote to Catholic malcontents who were unhappy with the Elizabethan Church of England. Mary was tied to a number of plots designed to overthrow the English government and replace one queen for another. For example, the Ridolfi plot in 1571, the Throckmorton plot of 1583, and the Babington plot of 1586. That last plot was a clever trap designed by Francis Walsingham, perhaps England's earliest James Bond figure. Walsingham set up a system of communication between Mary and a group of Catholic rebels. They sent letters in and out of the castle prison through a false bottom in a beer cask. They were unaware of the trap and communicated freely. Walsingham intercepted these letters, recorded their content, and then sent them along to their intended audience. Then their contents were, the, were summarized in a report to Elizabeth. They were then signed with the symbol of an owl, which was her nickname for Walsingham. When viewed a certain way, this owl symbol looks like it says 007. This apparently influenced Ian Fleming at a young age. But at any rate, it was just a matter of time until a new assassination plot was devised, and so the Babington plot had irrevocable ties to Mary Stuart. After much delay, Elizabeth finally signed a letter of condemnation. Mary was tried for treason, found guilty, and condemned to die. Mary never recognized the court that found her guilty. After all, how can a sovereign queen of another kingdom be found guilty of treason without being a subject? I can't imagine a prime minister coming to the United States and being found guilty of treason there. But the counselors fulfilled their duty and hired an executioner to behead the queen on the 8th of February, 1587. It was a nerve wracking affair. Much of the legitimacy of the trial and the genuineness of Elizabeth's wishes were in question and presumably the executioner was nervous. Mary was escorted to the room. She took off her robes and revealed a crimson satin bodice underneath, the colors of a Catholic martyr. Mary Stuart intended to die as a martyr to her Catholic faith, and she prayed to God one last time before kneeling before a satin pillow and laying her head down with her neck exposed. This striking display can only have made the situation more tense. The executioner raised his ax and struck the queen on the back of her head. She uttered a low groan. Some sources say the executioner tried again, landing the second blow between her shoulder blades. The third strike finally hit the mark, but failed to completely sever the head from the body. The executioner had to retrieve a hunting knife in order to cut the remaining skin and sinew from the body. Having done that, he reached down to show the head to the audience and proclaim, here lies the head of a traitor, long live the queen. But it was not so simple. As the executioner grasped the head, he pulled her hair off and the head flew to the ground. You see, years of imprisonment had rendered Mary close to bald and she wore a wig. The executioner had to retrieve the head and hold it aloft with both hands over her ears. Here is the head of a traitor. Long live the queen. And then, some sources say, Mary's body began to move. Her skirts rose up as if to protest until a very small dog emerged, pawing at her clothing. Mary had reportedly smuggled in her lapdog underneath her skirts in order to accompany her on this final terrible day. The audience moved awkwardly and a messenger was sent to inform the queen that the deed had been done. Elizabeth reacted to the news in shock. She denied that she had ever signed any papers to authorize this event. She clapped the messenger in the tower and plunged the entire court into mourning. Mary's death was diplomatically convenient for Elizabeth, but by making it out as though she had nothing to do with it, 
Elizabeth was able to send a strong message about how unacceptable the death of a sister queen really was. Spain responded by sending its famous armada in 1588, but the Protestant winds blew it off course and Elizabeth was able to make a stunning speech about being a weak and feeble woman with the heart and stomach of a king, and a king of England too. In the 1590s, Mary's memory fell into the background and eyes began to turn to her son, the future James I of England. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes.